Couldn't keep it to myself. Said I wasn't gonna sing about it, but I 
Come on, sir. I love getting together with the men because though in God's eyes we are equal to the women in God's eyes, but God always believes in distributing different responsibilities. And I believe that Acts chapter 16 really demonstrates this, at least for Paul and the people that were with him. In Acts 16, Paul gets his vision to go to Macedonia. But in verse 10, it says something special about how everyone else reacted to Paul's vision. It says here, it says, after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God has called us to preach the gospel to them. I love what this scripture says because it's saying that one person got the vision, but everyone else started to live the dream around them. Wow. See, as then, uh, it, it's going to be quite funny. By the end of this conference, don't be surprised when you go up to someone and say, hey, what's your kingdom dream? Oh, and they respond to you, what's a kingdom dream? Right. I promise you, somebody's going to say that in the conference. Yeah. They're, they're going to fly up there. Are you living the dream? What's the dream? Yeah. So us as men, it, the call is not just to adopt Jesus' dream for our life. But it is just like Jesus, he was going out to everybody else, calling people to do such things. Yeah. He wasn't just having a dream for himself, but he was calling everybody to do the same thing that he was doing. And as men, we have a responsibility that not are we only called to be the dreamers, but we are called to inspire everyone else around us to dream as well. So I just want to welcome all of you guys, you dreamers, to inspire other dreamers as well. I want to welcome you to the men workshop of the Alpha Triad Conference. So let's get God involved. Please join me in a word of prayer. Come on. Bow your head. Amen. Father God, thank you so much, Father, for calling these men to be your dreamers, God. Thank you for providing the dream, God, that we're not trying to find our own dream, God. We're not trying to look into our own lives and say, what do I want? But That's instead, right. we look into our lives and say, what do you want from us, God? God, I pray that you inspire these dreamers not to only start asking that question to themselves, but to those around each other as well. Dad, please get involved today. We love you very much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, bro. Hey, brothers, we will now be singing song number four, Heart Fights in the Soul. We will stand up.
fighting soldier. Make some noise! <laughs> Facing imminent death herself. Wow. 
And so my question to you is why are you scared to dream? Come on, Mike. Three points. Number one, face the dream. Okay. Number two, embrace the dream. All right. And number three, don't waste the dream. Mm. Amen? Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 4. You know, God's dream changed the world. So if God's dream changed the world, guess who hates that dream? Satan hates a godly dream. Mm. And so dreams, we understand that, are a battle that have to be fought for. Because God changed the world through his dream. Yes. Satan hates a dream, and we must fight for the dream. Yes. In 2 Kings 4, we're going to see an account of Elisha as he speaks to a woman who decided to stop dreaming. Come on, bro. 2 Kings 4, verse 8. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. It says, <laughs> one day, Elisha went to Shunem. And a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So if you don't know who Elisha was, Elisha originally was a student of Elijah. Who's Elijah? Elijah was the prophet who killed 450 prophets of Baal in one encounter as God brings down this huge fireball from heaven and just completely destroys his altar while the prophets of Baal couldn't do anything. <laughs> Elisha is picked by Elijah while plowing a field in 2 Kings 19. In 1 Kings 18, that's where Elijah kills the prophets. And then in 2 Kings 2, Elisha and Elisha go out, and Elisha is taken up, Elijah is taken up to heaven, and Elisha gets a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And I mean, if Elijah could call down a fireball from heaven, imagine having a double portion of that guy. <laughs> and so now Elisha has it. And in 2 Kings 3, it's interesting, as they remember who Elisha is and call him into the king's service, they refer to him as the one who washed the hands of Elijah. See, there was a student and apprentice relationship between Elijah and Elisha. Yeah. Mm. But now that Elijah is gone, Elisha's inherited a double portion of his spirit, <laughs> meaning that Elisha actually could do sometimes more, usually he could do more than Elijah. Yeah. Elisha raised two people from the dead. Elijah only raised one guy from the dead. <laughs> so you start seeing this double portion wasn't just a, a figurative speech, it was true. Come on. And here is Elisha, the man of God, who comes to the city of Shunem. And he walks in, and, and this incredible widow, this incredible woman takes, takes care of him. Verse 9. She said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make a small room on the roof. And put in it a bed and a table, a chair and a lamp for him. Come on. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. One day, when Elisha came, he went up to his room and lay down. He said to his servant, God, call us to the light. So he called her and she stood before him. Elisha said to him, tell her, you've gone to all this trouble for us. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? She replied, I have a home among my people. Come on. What can be done for her, Elisha asked. Gehazi said, well, she has no son, and her husband's old. Then Elisha said, call her. So he called her, and she stood at the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. No, my lord, she objected. Don't mislead your servant, whom I am of God. And here you think, what an interesting reaction. A man of God comes. A man of God says you're going to get a child. And she says, don't mislead your servant right here. See, the first point is you got to face the dream. Yeah. Come on. See, the correct response would have been gratitude, wouldn't it? <laughs> like, thank you so much. The man who had a double portion of Elijah is giving me my dream. That's better than a genie in a bottle right Come on. <laughs> And yet, she says, no, 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 don't mislead me. Come on, bro. <clears throat> See, she was scared by the dream. Wow. She wasn't ready for the dream. Come on, back. Why? Well, what could have happened? Well, first you see, there, there was a, a negative reaction to God's dream. Mm. But what does that 
that show when you react negatively to the dream God has? It shows you're distant to God. You're far from God. Because if she would have been close to God, then when God gives her the dream, she would have gotten fired up. But instead, you see, her heart was far. A person close to God doesn't react negatively to God's dreams. Come on. Why would she react negatively? Well, maybe there was a prophet in the past. She was a well-to-do woman. Maybe a prophet in the past had promised her something, and it didn't come true. Come on, come on bro. And she says, don't mislead me. Not another one of you guys. Not another religious guy telling me to have a dream. Come on. <laughs> maybe she had gone into this state of self-protection. Mm. See, sometimes... In order to survive, you just have to say, well, if I just protect my heart from getting hurt, I'll be okay. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. And so we want to protect our hearts from the dream. Thinking that that's God's plan or that's smart. That's stupid. <laughs> Amen, guys? Yeah. Yeah. To, to protect yourself from God's dream and God's plan on, is, is, well, whose plan are you following then? Mm. It's not God's. Whose plan is it? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe being barren, she had thought she was cursed. Sometimes we're given a dream and we think, how could, how could, like, I see, I understand Mason could get the dream. Mm -hmm. Or Scott. I mean, those guys are awesome. Yeah. But for me to get the dream, do you know who I am? Do you know how cursed I am? And the woman, because she was barren, was probably considered cursed. So when they told her, hey, you're going to get a son, she said, no, don't mislead me. You don't know how messed up I really am. See, sometimes we think our checkered past is disqualifying us from God's dream today. Come on, Michael. Come on. And so she goes, and, and so what we see in her life is that she had settled for a safe dream. She had settled for a life of, of being comfortable in her community, being comfortable with her family, because if you can't live the big dream, then you should survive living the comfortable dream. Come on, Michael. She said it. Come on, bro. But God says, no. No, I'm, I'm not going to let you off the hook. Come on, Come on God. Come on. I'm not going to let you get off being distant and cold to me. Mm. And not getting your dream. So instead, here you go. And she says, no! Don't mess with me! You know, Come on. why are dreams... Why, why in the first place would I even ask you if a dream is scary? Doesn't that sound like a paradox? Mm -hmm. Aren't dreams like these beautiful Disneyland things that they make movies about? <laughs> why are you afraid of that? I mean, we're men. We don't fear dreams. Because dreams damage you. Dreams hurt. Dreams come with pain. And we, we're scared of dreams because the dream makes you vulnerable. I mean, isn't it interesting that every time Kip or Joe Willis or, or somebody from the former fellowship that's now in the new fellowship talks about the dream, what do they start doing? Crying. Mm. You notice that? You notice Elena? She starts to cry when she talks about the church. Well, why do people cry? Because there's pain. Right. See, that, that road is a painful road. Come on, Mike. And that's why you have to be asked, are you, why are you scared to dream? Why are we scared? Because there's pain involved. Come on, Mike. Come on, brother. Come on, bro. And so, this woman in the message version says, don't play games with me. Don't play games. Don't play games with me, Elisha. And it reminds me of a song, maybe you sing the song, called Quit Playing Games With My Heart. <laughs> oh, my God. Be real about it. Sing it, bro. <laughs> it says, even in my heart I see You're not being true to me Deep within my soul I feel Nothing like this like it's used to be Quit playing games With my heart With my heart With my heart <laughs>
crumbled, my dream crumbled with them. Yeah. And I realized I'd put my hope in people rather than in God. Wow. But I didn't realize it until I got restored back in the new movements. <laughs> because when the people all left, my faith in God fell apart too. Wow. And I fell away. Talk I fell away it. for three years. Talk about it. And I went to a comfortable life of survival. Yeah. Let me just do what I want to do and not give my heart to anybody and just live for the moment. And it ruined me. And finally, God brought me back. But to be brought back, I mean, it meant I had to face the pain. And it was scary. I, I started hating disciples. I had to love oh, disciples again. I, I didn't, I didn't want to, to be radical. I had to get radical. Finally, I, I was talking to, uh, I, had, I was being discipled uh, at the time by Kip I was, as I was leading the teens in L.A. Kip says, bro, where do you want to go for a church plan? And I was like, I, I don't know. Like, <laughs> do you want to go to Brazil? Do you want to go to Moscow? Do you want to go to Hong Kong? I was like, I've been to Hong Kong before. I think Hong Kong might be a good choice. He's like, okay, I'll call. Later, a few days later, I get a call. Okay. We're gonna put you on the team. You're gonna you're gonna lead the Hong Kong plant. Yeah. <laughs> now I was single at the time. I thought no sister is ever gonna date me now. <laughs> but I also thought, and then he said, and you know, I want you to be interested in these three sisters. So I think I, I was like, I think that call literally just determined who I'm gonna marry and where I'm gonna die. <laughs> and it was a five minute call. <laughs> And, and it was intense because I had to face the dream that for me, I thought Hong Kong is going to be the place where I die. Because if you go to Hong Kong, you got to go to mainland China. Right? You don't just stop in Hong Kong. You go all the way into the heart of the beast right here. Amen? Amen. And so I had to just, I mean, maybe you guys, some of you guys can relate that, that you know, there's death involved, possibly. We might be talking about the city you die in. When we talk about the city you're going to plant. And you have to accept it. But you also have to know it's a part of the dream. Amen? Amen. <laughs> but if, if you don't have anything to die for, then you really don't have anything to live for. Amen? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so if you're not willing to die for the dream, then are you really living for the dream? Yeah. Come on, bro. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Come on, bro. So here, she's forced to dream again. Come on. And, and who was the scary guy in this story at the moment? The prophet of God. Is that intense? Yeah, yeah. You gotta realize, men who get you to dream are scary people. Oh, yeah. You might be like, man, this brother's so scary. Yeah, because he's a prophet. Yeah. And prophets scare people who are comfortable in their dreams. Yeah. It's scary to go where a prophet's gonna take you. Come on. But you've gotta understand, it's not just the prophet, it's God trying to take you there. Amen? Yeah. Come on. Second point is embrace the dream. Come Amen? On, Come on, Mike. So, so what happens? Let's keep going. Come on, come on, Mike. She says, verse 17, but the woman became pregnant, and the next year about the same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha had told her. Mm. So here, the woman said, no, no, don't mislead me. Didn't matter, did it? No. <laughs> she still got pregnant, and she still was forced <laughs> to embrace the dream. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's a lot like your baptism. <laughs> you got baptized. Yep. You're like, okay, what does this mean? It doesn't matter. You now must embrace the dream. Amen. The woman was given a baby. Guess what you were given? The Holy Spirit. Come on. Amen? Amen. Amen. But anybody who's been repentant and baptized is now filled with the Holy Spirit and must embrace the dream no matter what. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. If we're here talking about whether you should dream God's dream, it's not an issue of trying to get you to dream. It's just an issue of trying to get you to repent. Yeah. Amen. Because you already got the dream. You got the dream when you got baptized. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't go up to heaven because God put you here to accomplish his dream. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. So it's not, please dream, please dream, please dream. No, please repent. Before you jeopardize your own salvation. Come on, man. Because God put the dream inside of you already. Man. But now it's the question, what's making you afraid to dream? Come on. See here, God says, okay, you're pregnant. Let's keep going. Come on. Come on, bro. Come on. She's forced to dream. Come on. She became pregnant. Verse 18. The child grew. And one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers. My head, my head, he said to his father. His father told the servant, carry him to his mother. 
After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed in the man of God, of the man of God, and then shut the door and went out. She called her husband and said, Please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. Come on. But why go to him today? He asked. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. It's all right, she said. She sat on the donkey and said to her servant, Lead me on. Lead on. Don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant, God, said, Look, there's a Shunammite. Run to meet her and ask her, Are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Everything's all right, she said. When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. God, he came over to push her away. But the man of God said, Leave her alone. She's in bitter distress, but the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. So here we have the next section. The woman didn't want to face the dream. God says, doesn't matter. You're going to have to face it anyway. And she gets pregnant. The baby grows. She gives birth to the baby. She feeds the baby. She sees the baby grow up. She holds the baby. She embraces the baby. This baby is hers. And now he's a little boy. And the boy is out in the field. And the boy gets some kind of head pain. And goes to his dad. And what does the dad do? Gets a servant and says, take him to his mom. See right here, you, number one you see with his dad, he didn't even care about the dream anymore. Because what kind of dad, when his son is dying, gives him to his servant to take him to the mom? Ooh, you know, uh, the boy over there. <clears throat> see, sometimes people just refuse to dream. Yeah. Come on, Mike. Sometimes they just refuse. Right. They made up their mind not to dream anymore. Yeah. Maybe some of you guys, I don't know, I hope that's not you. I mean, if that's you, I don't know why you're here. If you're refusing to dream, you got to repent right now. Come on, Mike. And you got to say, I'm going to dream. I'm going to dream God's dream. No more hardening my heart. I'm not going to be this cold-hearted dude. But I'm going to be a man who loves, a man who cares. Come on, Mike. So the servant brings him to the mom. The mom holds the boy. And can you imagine holding your son as he screams? And, and as a, a parent... When your child is in pain and you can't do anything, there's nothing worse. You just, you just, you want to fix it, but you can't. And so here she's holding her son in, and he's just screaming, my head, my head, my head. And she's probably praying, just to say, God, you gave me my dream. Protect my dream. Help him. Help him, God. Come on. And it gets worse, and his cries get worse. And she cries for her, help him! And he dies in her arms. Wow. And she's holding the dream. She's embracing the dream. But this time, the dream has a face. Mm-hmm. This time, the dream is her son. Come on. And this time, the dream is personal. So this time she doesn't run. She could have in her bitterness buried her son. But what does she do? She holds him and she walks up the stairs knowing what's at the top. The door to the prophet's room. She takes a step. Takes a step. Takes a step. Opens the door. Lays him on the prophet's bed. Closes the door and leaves. And I can imagine because there is a face to her dream as she's walking up I just imagine just saying, and what she does after this, she just takes a step, and she says, not today. And then she takes another step, not today. Mm. She looks at her, her dead son, and she just says, not today. Come on. Not today. Yeah. She opens the door, lays him down. Shuts the door and says, not today. Yeah, come on, man. She goes to her husband and says, give me a donkey. Give me a servant. He says, it's not, it's not the new moon. It's not the Sabbath. Her own husband wouldn't support her dream. She says, not today. Come on. She gets on that, on that donkey. She goes to, the, to Elisha. Yeah. She sees Elisha. She falls at her feet, 
falls at his feet, pulls his feet. And I'm sure she thought, not today. Mm. Not today. Because she refused to give up because she was very scared. Mm. Yeah. You know, she owned the dream. She was invested in the dream. She was close to the dream. Come on. Come on, bro. And she had a choice. Would she do what she did before, run away in bitterness and harden her heart towards God? Or would she run to God with her dream? Would she go with tears to God? Because essentially Elisha represents God. Amen? She goes. And, and you see that, that God was trying to teach her a lesson. Yeah. It wasn't just about the dream. It's about, are you going to come to me or are you going to run from me? Yeah. What are you going to do when I give you something so scary? As your dream. Where are you going to take it? Is it going to make you bitter or is it going to make you better? Is it going to force you on your knees or is it going to force you to run? Which one will your dream do? And God says, that's the lesson. I'll give you your dream, but guess what? I'll take it away even worse than when you never had it. But he says, but what will you do at that moment? What will your words be? Because all of us will have that moment. There will be a day where we're embracing our dream. Yeah. And our dream dies in front of us. Come on. Yeah. Whether it's a Bible study, whether it's a church, where the church just, the, the people have issues, like all churches do, amen? <laughs> and you just think, okay, what? Go with God, or will I just run away? Yeah. People who run away, you know what they do? They go to the survival dreams, the easy dreams. They follow yeah. the desire rather than to deep dream. And so they go, and they stop following what God has for them. So she embraces the dream. I want to ask you, is your dream personal? Yeah. Is there a face to your dream? Wow. Come on, Mike. Mm. Or is your dream about yourself? See, what was Jesus' dream? Jesus' dream But what are, whose face is on your dream? See, the, there's only one face that should be on your dream, and that's Jesus' face. Amen. 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 He's the one who died for you. I mean, if you do what Scotty said last night and go over the cross or watch the Passion, at the end you're going to think, there's one face on my dream right here, and that's the face of Jesus. Amen. And so if he dies, I die. If he gives up everything, I give up everything. Come on, Mike. But that's the face of my dream right here. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and so... Here, the dream must be personal. For me, there's, a, there's an incredible brother back in, uh, in Los Angeles. His name's George Cornejo. Come on, he's, he's from Mexican descent, born in East Los Angeles. He was born with a heart defect. And so throughout his, his childhood, he would, he would stop breathing and turn pale, and his mom thought he was going to die. <laughs> and he still would go to the hospital once a month because his heart has issues. Later on, his brother gets killed in a drive-by shooting. And then this guy becomes a disciple. But while he's a young disciple, he's praying and he's dreaming. And we even had an all-night prayer. And after the all-night prayer, he drives and totals his car. Right? The dream was getting tested right there. And then it happened again. And, and then for him, just the battle was, do I want to keep dreaming? It's so painful to dream in the kingdom. I mean, to get in a car accident, shouldn't God protect you from that? But God says, are you going to come to me with your dream or are you going to run from it? Ultimately, he keeps pushing forward. He, he gets into ICCM. He gets into a four-year university. And before he went to four-year university, he said, my dream is to baptize four guys on this closed campus in Pasadena. Oh. And over the summer, he's a part of four baptisms at Pasadena City College. <laughs> and for George, it was just, are you going to persevere with the dream? A lot of times, we want to say, no, no, the dream's impossible. It's too hard. Yeah. I can't dream for these people. I went and I shared with three of them, and they all said no. They all said no. It's close. It's a close campus. Okay. It's a close campus. It's a close city. Because I talked to five of them. I talked to five people. <laughs> I even studied with one of them. And, he, and, he, and then he sent me a text saying he found another church. There's no dream. The dream is dead. you got to realize, no, there's still a face to your dream, and that face is Jesus. Come on, bro. And what does Jesus say about your campus? The heart.
harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Right. The harvest is plentiful. The dreamers are few. Because a dream makes you work, doesn't it? And so here it's it's not about is your heart is your campus plentiful? It is. It's are you dreaming for it? It is. Are you dreaming and then working for it? Amen? Amen. And I guarantee you, you'll be like George Cornejo. It doesn't matter if you have a heart defect and you came from a bad past. God still has an awesome harvest for you. <laughs> Even in your church that you're in right now. Amen? Amen. So, so here, she embraces the dream. She comes out strong. She's all set. She's fired up. Let's keep reading right here. What happens? So it says, When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Gehazi came over to push her away, but the man of God said, Leave her alone. She's in bitter distress. But the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. Come on, Mara. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? She said, Did I tell you? Don't raise my hopes. Elisha said to Gehazi, Tuck your cloak in your belt. Take my staff in your hands and run. If you meet anyone, do not greet them. And if anyone greets you, do not answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, As surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. <laughs> so he got up and followed. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him, The boy's not awakened. When Elisha reached the house, there was a boy. There was a boy lying down on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay upon the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As he stretched himself out upon him, the boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room. And then got on the bed and stretched out upon him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite. And he did. When, when she came, he said, take your son. She came in, fell at his feet, and bowed the ground. Then she took her son. You know, she faced her dream, forced by God to face the dream. She embraced the dream. And running to God, I mean, it meant tears for her. It meant pain. It meant falling in prayer. And really, if, if you have to know that the dream is, is a road of tears. Yeah. Come on, bro. The dream is a road of, of broken hearts. Yeah. You don't just follow broken dreams. You just don't start with broken dreams, but that new dream is a road of broken hearts. Amen. But when you cry, Psalms 126 says, in tears you sow seed, but you reap them with songs of joy. Come on, brother. And here you see Psalm 126 with this woman, don't you? She sowed in tears, but she finally reaps with that song of joy right there at the end. Amen. You know, the last point is don't waste the dream. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Don't waste the dream. You know, it's, it's interesting. This, this weird part of the story is Gehazi. Isn't he like, what's going on with this guy? <laughs> Come on. He's, a, he's Elisha's servant. Mm. And yet he can't do anything. Doesn't that just, is that just interesting? <laughs> what, what's the point? Why would he even be mentioned in the accounts? What a loser. Somebody says, not today. Wow. Yes, it's not today. Wow. What, what's going on? Wow. See, Elisha didn't waste the dream when he called Elijah. If you actually read in 1 Kings 17, what Elisha did was exactly what Elijah did. Elijah was faced with a dead boy. He goes in, and Elijah, I mean, it's weird that Elisha spreads his whole body on the boy. But that's exactly what Elijah did. <laughs> See, he's imitating the God. He's imitating the heart, the soul, the spirit, everything wow. of the man who he served. And that's what made Elisha so powerful. He imitated Elijah even to the point where he brings the boy back just like Elijah did. Yeah. Is that crazy? Yeah. Did Gehazi imitate Elisha? No, you don't even see the passion. You don't see the care. You don't see the faith. You don't see that Gehazi had the dream. Gehazi simply followed a man with the dream. And here, this is one of the scariest parts if you're in the church. Come on, bro. That you can come, but
But you can come and follow someone else's dream. Mm. You can come and it can be Joe's dream or Kip's dream or Nick's dream or, or Cheese's dream or whoever, Scotty's dream. And they can tell you, hey, go do this. And you're like, cool, I'll go do it. All right, go to campus and share. Okay, I'll go share. All right, go do the Bible study. Okay, I'll do it. But until it's your dream, yeah. you can't do anything. Yeah. Come on, man. See, it's, why, is, why is this about living the dream? Because if it's not your dream, the world doesn't change. Mm-hmm. The world doesn't change just because our leaders have the dream. Right. Elisha didn't change the world because Elijah had the dream. It became Elisha's dream. But Gehazi couldn't change the world because it wasn't his dream. Wow. He wasted the dream. Come on, Mike. It was wasted on Gehazi. Yeah. He thought, oh, I'm in the company of a prophet. The prophet preaches the right doctrine. The prophet does miracles. I'm surely going to be good, too. If you find out two chapters later, he gets <coughs> leprosy and is condemned for, for the rest of his generations. Because he never imitated the heart of the prophet. And so here we see that don't be afraid of the dream. And you don't have to fear the dream. You simply need to imitate your leader in the dream. Come on, Mike. You need to do what he does. A lot of times, like, I don't know if I can do this. Just imitate your leader. I don't know if I know how to preach. Imitate your leader. I don't know if I can baptize. Then imitate your leader right here. Do exactly what he does. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can go there. Imitate your leader. And if you imitate him and you get the dream he has, then you don't need to be afraid of the dream right here. Amen? Amen. God gave you somebody who can accomplish the dream so you can be just like that guy. That's a blessing. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so so when you look at all this, I think understanding, man, there's so many things, though. There's so many things. I mean, do you dream? What are are your dreams? I want to give you a few practicals. Come on, man. What is the dream? Build God's kingdom. Yeah. That's it. Why are you still here after baptism? To build God's kingdom. That's the dream. When you got the spirit, that became your dream. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you're not dreaming to build God's kingdom, then just repent right now. Amen? Amen. Just repent. Because whatever you're building is going to burn anyway. Right. So build the dream. Build God's kingdom. And once you have that, then you have to think, okay, trust God and then pray. What is God's dream for you? And building his eternal <coughs> God has a dream for you. Come on, but have you figured out what it is? I mean, look at this place. What are they trying to figure out? What's my dream? Because the title is scary enough. I was like, I am scared of my dream. Yes. <laughs> I don't even know what my dream is, but I'm just scared to dream. Because it means failure. Amen? Amen? Trust God. Pray for your dreams. And then I want to call you, imitate someone who's living your dream. Wow. Imitated, just like Elijah imitated Elisha. Right? I remember I wasn't being very fruitful in Cal State Fulton. I called up a sister in another church. That's how desperate I was. I'm like, I'll call anybody, anywhere, anytime. I want to figure out how to be fruitful. She said, Oh, we just we just have faith. <laughs> she said, yeah, come we, on, bro. we go up to people and we invite them, and when they say, Yeah, I really want to come out, we're like, Yeah, of course you do. Because this is the kingdom of God. Wow. We're gonna crank. And I said, no way, I haven't been doing that at all. I'm surprised when people want to come to church. I'm surprised when people want to study the Bible. And she said, oh, that's just because, that just shows you don't have any faith. Ooh. And this sister just diced up my heart. <laughs> and I've never been the same since, to be honest. <laughs> and, and so, you know, here, are you in faith going to imitate and live that dream? And if you want to imitate them, you've got to spend time with them. You have to do that. Amen? Amen? You've got to think like them and talk like them. Yes. So, so here, don't give in to the lies, the wasted dreams, that it's somebody else's dream, but it's not possible. Mm-hmm. Guess when that happens? Guess where you go when that happens? You get bitter. Yeah. You get resentful. Mm-hmm. You get ticked off. Why are you making me work so hard? Yeah. And then ultimately, it can cost you your salvation. So make it your dream, amen? Amen. So that when it's your dream, then you go out and you work the hardest field. And don't work it and be surprised when somebody's open. Because Jesus says, it's totally open, amen? Amen. So when you get a yes, you should be like, of course you said yes. I'm surprised people don't say yes more often. I'm shocked they said no. And I'm just going to keep sharing and sharing and sharing. Amen? Amen. You know, there's, there's some stupid guys out there doing stupid things for stupid dreams. Yeah. Even in Sydney, Australia, there's a guy right now 
right now, miles away, who is painting black squares blindfolded on a wall to protest Amazon fires. And he just, you look at a picture, he just painted a black square. And he's like, why is he painting black squares? To protest the fires on Amazon. Well, how's it going? You just made three black squares blindfolded. That's it. Are there, are there more fires? Who knows? <laughs> okay, so, so let me get this straight. You're gonna stop the fires by drawing black squares on a wall in a city. <laughs> and that's gonna stop the fires in the Amazon. Yes, that's my dream. Guess who the real dreamers are? People who dream to build God's kingdom. Come on, bro. Amen. And so, so there's the three points. You take the F from face the dream. You take the E from embrace the dream. Even when it hurts, even when it kills you, embrace the dream. Even if it means your death, embrace the dream. Come on, Mike. And then you take the W from don't waste the dream. What do you have? Only a few. Only a few truly dream God's dream. Come on. Only a few do this. But those few, that's all it takes yeah. to change the world. Come on. Jesus says, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Because I tell you, many will try, but only a few will enter it. That's right. Why are you scared of dreams? Because God's dreams are big. Yeah. And big dreams to change the world are scary. But what does it take? It just takes a few who are willing to face the dream, embrace the dream, and not waste the dream. And I tell you, my brothers, we will change this world in our generation. Amen, guys? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. I'll take a five-minute fellowship break.